Great, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here today and I'm excited to talk on this topic. It's nice to be in a room with people who think inguinal hernias are really, really, really important and I think that that's a really great thing. So I have one disclosure. I don't think that it's relevant to this talk, but I just want to put out there I do consult for Medtronic. So when we define what a recurrent inguinal hernia is, just to get the nomenclature straight, we're really referring to a hernia that's directly related to the primary hernia. I'm not going to talk about re-re-recurrent hernias or down that line. I really just want to focus on that first recurrence. And just to get a couple things out of the way, the most common sites of recurrence for opened are in the direct space after Lichtenstein and the femoral, and these may actually be missed. And if, after laparoscopic cases, they're indirect hernias, which are more likely to come back. Also, most recurrences occur within three years. So now that we got that out of the way, I really want to talk about some of the things that I think are important. And I know people have heard this before, but I think this is really true, particularly when we think about hernia repair, which is we really only have one chance to do it right. And an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. So if we can recognize things ahead of time, whether they be technical or surgeon factor or otherwise, that are making our patients more likely to recur, then that's only going to help us do a better operation that first time. This will be interactive. I'll ask people to vote. I'll ask people to do things, not on the things by show of hand. So I really hope that you'll participate so it can be enjoyable. So when we talk about inguinal hernia recurrences, what do we mean? And if you look at the data, it's really varied depending on the study that you look at. You see some series, such as coming out of Sweden or uh, some of the registries in Europe, they're as low as half a percent, up to 15 percent. So what's going on here? Why is this happening? And when I think about this, this kind of breaks down into three things, right? There's the technical aspects, the things we do during an operation that make a difference. There's the patient aspects, meaning that the person who comes into us has a whole different array of issues, problems, comorbid conditions, um, genetics that make a difference. And then the nebulous unknown. Who here has had the unknown hernia recurrence? Can't figure out what happened. Good patient, good technique, and it came back. Nobody? Just me? Okay, thank you. Thank you for not leaving me alone up here. And, you know, that kind of unknown factor, which is we can't really quite figure out what went wrong. Something went wrong, but we're not sure. So we're going to play a game of true or false, or maybe, just because the data aren't as robust in all sections. So let's talk about this one first. Non-mesh hernia repair, so repairs that are done without mesh are more likely to recur. True or false? True? Okay. Anybody from the Shoulders Clinic? That's the person who's going to get up to the mic. Anyway, so that is true. When you look at different series, particularly from prospective registries that have come out of Europe, we do see that mesh makes a difference. And for most hernia repairs and suitable patients, mesh does seem to decrease the um, recurrence rate. Now, there are exceptions to all the rules, and I poke fun, but if you do look at the data that comes from, say, like a Shoulders Clinic or for some other series, you may see some advantage to non-mesh repair. But for the most part, the data hold true on this. Okay, next one. I'm starting you guys off a little easy. Mesh size and fixation impact recurrence. True or false? Come on, guys, true, right? Like, good. So, right, so this does. So there was a Swedish hernia registry and a Danish hernia registry that looked at over 32,000 hernias, and they saw that fixation was a really big deal. And what they saw was even though they had a lower recurrence rate, about 0.7%, which is amazing, what they did find was that most recurrences happened immediately in that direct space from improper mesh fixation. Also, when they've looked at laparoscopic and open studies, what they've seen is that undersizing of the mesh leads to an increased recurrence. So it is important, the mesh that we use, to make sure it's appropriately sized and appropriately fixed, regardless if you're doing open or MIS techniques. Okay. Oh, my thing didn't come up. There we go. Whatever. So you'll know this one. MIS hernia repairs are less likely to recur. False, right? I mean, it's here, so we can all cheat. It'll be fine. Anyway, so the data are really mixed on this. I think everybody remembers that landmark bombshell paper that came out from the VA, which demonstrated that inguinal hernia is done laparoscopically were more likely to recur than open. And as a bias, I think that actually set down MIS or her, set back MIS hernia repair for quite a while just because we weren't sure where the data were. When they went and did a deep dive in that data, we saw it had more to do with surgeon experience, um, the learning associated with adoption of new technique than the, than the actual repair. 
but even in contemporary studies, we really don't see a benefit one way or another in terms of recurrence for open or versus MIS approach, which makes people say you should do the approach you're comfortable with. All right, here we go. Cord lipomas do not impact risk of recurrence. True or false? Good, false. So basically, cord lipomas that are encountered, whether in open or MIS repair, need to be addressed. With open repair, we tend to resect this. When we're doing an MIS repair, we have to inspect the canal to make sure that we've reduced any indirect, I'm sorry, any cord lipomas that might be present, and really reduce that down to the base of the vas and out of the way so that we can lay the mesh in to prevent the um, lipoma from going forward. If we don't do that, particularly in MIS cases, it may not be a true recurrence, but people can still have the perception of having a hernia there, and oftentimes it leads to re-operations. There was one early study that actually looked at this and thought that missed cord lipomas accounted for up to 30 to 50 percent of recurrent inguinal hernias after MIS repair. Now again, whether this is recurrent or missed, and what that means can be debated, but the issue is that they're there and we do have to address them, and it's a critical part to any repair that we're doing. All right, how about this one? Surgeon experience impacts risk of recurrence. True, right? That's true of anything we do. The more we do, the better that we get. And when we see the more experience that we get with any technique, rather than even minimally invasive or open, the better that we do and the better our outcomes. This is particularly important, however, in MIS surgery, where we've seen from some of the VA studies and other studies that there is a number, I think that number's around 250, where after which there's real differences that are seen in terms of patient outcomes. So it's something to keep in mind, particularly as we're learning and adopting new techniques. All right. All of the following increase the risk of recurrence on the patient factors. Previous hernia repair? You think that increases or doesn't impact? Increases, right? Okay. Smoking? Yes. Older age? Okay. Diabetes? Obesity? Immunosuppression? Gender? Nope, I got you, right? One of them had to have been different. So all of these things have been shown to kind of increase the likelihood of recurrence except for gender. And they look at this, and what they've seen for gender is that the studies are really mixed. Some people show a bias towards women, some people show a bias towards male, but at the end of the day, we don't know, but it does tend to be a factor. That said, I will say that women are very understudied in hernia disease processes with the majority of robust data occurring in white males. So for those of us and everybody in the audience doing hernia research, please make sure that you include that population. I see Eugenia Drellis, that was for you also. How about this one? Anesthesia impacts the risk of recurrence. Yes, I heard a yes. Come on guys, it's after lunch. Maybe? All right, so this is our maybe, okay? So I was really surprised by this because I actually didn't know it. And there's some old, not older, older data that shows that doing a surgery under local anesthetic versus general or sedation actually impacts the risk of recurrence. And they looked at this in the Swedish hernia registry and this seemed to bear out. However, when they looked at it in the Danish hernia registry, it seemed like other factors, patient factors and technique were the reason for the difference. So the jury's still out on this. We have two, you know, very good prospective registries with different, um, outcomes. All right, how about genetics? Absolutely, right? So we know that this is true. How many people have like father, sons, and like grandkids coming into your office, or somebody comes in and says, oh, my dad had that, or my grandfather had a hernia, right? So there's some hernias that have a strong genetic predisposition that we can see run in families. And what we saw was that the more hernias you have and the more hernias that run in the family or the more times your hernia recur, the more likely you are to have recurrences. And there's a lot of different mechanisms about why this happens. Sometimes it's a decreased ratio of type 1 to type 3 collagen or higher levels of matrix metalloproteinases. These are all things that have to do with the structural integrity of collagen. Interestingly, these are some of the same issues that we see in patients with aortic aneurysms, particularly with the vessels dilating, which might explain some of the association we see between aneurysms and hernia. So at the end of the day, those are really the main risk factors. And so when you get somebody who kind of comes to your office and has a recurrent hernia, 
really your clinical exam is key. And a good sophisticated clinical exam is really better than any imaging resource you may have, especially if the recurrence is obvious. So I'll put this out there, which is really a pet peeve of mine. The imaging is not mandatory. If somebody comes in with a recurrent hernia and it's confirmed by your exam and there's a clear bulge and the symptoms correlate, we don't have to go on to get ultrasound, CT, or MRI, or other modalities. The clinical exam is enough. And what to do is alternate the pair to what was done last, right? The definition of insanity is doing the same thing again and expecting a different result. So if someone comes in with a open recurrence after an open hernia, then you wanna go laparoscopic. If it's a recurrence after a laparoscopic hernia, you wanna go open. You wanna go where the tissue planes are native. It makes the operation um, tech, a little bit technically easier and I think also increases the risk that the hernia won't re-recur. And if you do have somebody who comes in with a recurrence, use MeSH. This data comes out of um, the European uh, hernia registries where they looked at re-recurrence, meaning the risk of occurring again after fixing a recurrent hernia. And what they saw was that the lower risk for re-recurrence were really performed in operations that use MeSH, whether that be laparoscopic or open MeSH hernia repair versus non-MeSH repairs. And it's a big difference, right? One to 7% versus 20%. So in conclusion, recurrence rates for primary inguinal hernia repairs range from 0.5 to 15%. You know, the truth is always somewhere in the middle. I think if you look at the majority of the data, that number is probably around 2 to 4%. And there's a lot of risk factors associated with primary failure of inguinal hernia repairs. Technical issues, what we do in the operating room, what procedure we choose, where we place our mesh, how we size our mesh, what anesthetic we use, patient-related factors, and surgeon experience. And really, when you choose to repair these, you should choose an anatomic approach that avoids the previously dissected planes. So with that, I will say thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions.